Today, I'm going to debunk some of the biggest myths around electrostatic discharge protection in robotics and show you what the data says actually works. The best place to put ferrites will be on motor wires, not on signal wires. Much of the common advice you hear about preventing ESD on your robot is based on guesswork, and some of it might actually be hurting the sensitivity of your sensor and motor data. I'm Coach Pratt, and for over a decade, I've taught robotics and design. I've coached FTC Robotics teams to success as national champions. The information I'm sharing today comes directly from some testing conducted by another mentor who holds their PhD in electrical engineering. It's this data-driven approach that's going to help you improve your skills in robotics. We'll start today by covering what ESD is and how it might be damaging your reliability. Then I'll walk you through what the data actually says on what strategies work. And finally, we'll look at some common advice that might be leading you astray. Now, one thing I do want to start this off by just putting a little note, don't take absolutely everything here that is stated as gospel. Treat it as another data point. If you yourself are finding data that you're running uh, past that seems to disagree with these events, but you're getting more reliable outcomes, go with what the data says. So we might be getting a little bit controversial here, but with some data. Electrical wiring can be feel a little bit superstitious, kind of like when the dog barks at the mailman, the mailman has yet to kid that my entire family, so I continue to bark at the dog. Uh, there's no way of knowing whether it's actually working or not unless you have the data to test. So I'm so thankful that there's a mentor out there who's willing to get the empirical data and have the knowledge of a PhD in electrical engineering to be able to figure out whether some of this stuff actually works or not. So a huge thank you, and to be it's just awesome to be part of the community who is willing to share this knowledge uh, for our next generation of engineers. First things first, what exactly is electrostatic discharge? It is when two objects that have a different amount of charge collide. That is where you get that disruption of your robot control systems. When you have things of opposite charges. Well, not necessarily opposite. Things that have different amounts of charges. Sorry. Why exactly is it important to actually care about ESD events? I'm sure you've all probably had the experience when you're working on a robot and you're walking around on a field, be it styrofoam tiles or whatever have you, and you get a static shock. Here is an example of a self-electrocuting robot. So this robot had a box tube slide. And rather than using metal adapters for things, what they did is they used 3D printed adapters. But what they ended up doing is they ended up creating a self-insulating part where each section of box tube slide had its own charge. And it would end up causing itself to give itself a static shock. And because of that, they killed two of their robot expansion hubs or their, their PLCs on their robot. Because they're making their own Van de Graaff generator effectively. Because uh, they were charging up their arm. So this stuff can be really important to care about. And as you're going to see later, it's actually pretty simple to solve some of these problems. So let's talk about some of the common ways that robots can generate static. Wheels, things sliding around, anything that moves and is not metal is likely to generate static. So if you have some sort of rubber implement rubbing on the ground, if you have wheels that roll across the floor, if you have belts running across things, those are going to generate static. Again, the static itself is not a problem. What is a problem is when two objects of different charges run into each other. Now in FTC robotics specifically, you are not allowed to ground your robot to the floor. If you uh, were working not in FTC robotics or not in a competitive robotics field, you 100% could ground your robot to the floor. In fact, you see some cars do this. There's a little strip that hangs down on those cars onto the ground. You may have seen one of these before. It's like a car grounding strap. And uh, that would mitigate a lot of these problems, but you were not allowed to do that inside of competitive robotics. And surprisingly, high humidity does help dissipate some of these static charges. There's two predominant ways that electrostatic or ESD effect can disrupt your robot. The first thing that it does is it creates an unexpected voltage spike through your robot's brain, be it your control hub, your expansion hub, or any other PLC you're using. Oftentimes what this can do is this can reset your robot, it can break your Wi-Fi connection, or your internal IMU or gyroscope goes a little bit wild. Over time, if you keep getting these static shocks, you will eventually degrade the protection circuits inside, despite a lot of these PLCs having protections inside them. There's two ways that ESD can get inside your robot through direct means and through indirect means a direct mean 
is directly shocking your robot hub. So for the most part, having a grounding strap and insulation layers, we'll talk about that. An indirect mean is something about called induction, where effectively you can have uh, every single wire is kind of like its own little radio antenna. And if you have a high enough electrical pulse near your wire, the electrical pulse, even if it didn't touch it, it will actually go inside and cause some electrostatic effects. So electricity is pretty wild in that respect. First, let's talk about uh, direct effects. So in order to test direct effects, this mentor went through and they set up a stick lighter that effectively used the edge of the stick lighter to shock directly into a JST connector. They had a coiled wire sitting next to that, and then they were able to measure that using oscilloscope to figure out what peak values are. This is the results of all their tests. If you'd like to see it in chart form, what is a little, so you can pause this, take a look. What's a little easier to look at is more photo form. So in order to stop direct effects, again, that is electricity going directly into those points or directly connecting with a wire or a control hub or your robot itself, whatever it may be, most insulating materials work well. So for instance, polycarbonate, 1.6 mil and 3 mil work just fine. Paper did not work. Electric tape did work. Masking tape did not work. Gaffer's tape did not work, but heat shrink and vinyl car wrap did. So anything that's vinyl, anything that's plastic, likely wood would also work in this case. It's a great insulator and, and four millimeters also a great way. So if you are setting your control hub up, you should put your control hub up on top of a piece of wood, piece of plastic, electro tape, vinyl wrap, whatever it is, so that it's off of the body of your robot. Real quick, if you and your team are finding value in this video, it really helped the channel if you give this a like and a subscribe. It really does help me reach more robotics enthusiasts like you. You need to find a way that your robot's internal static charge is not different from another robot's internal static charge. And one of the better way to do that is to create yourself some sort of shield or outside perimeter so that when your robot inevitably smacks into another robot or smacks into another field implement that has a different static charge than your robot does, you're not going to create an ESD effect. So lining PLA corner bumpers, polycarb side panels, putting vinyl covering on exposed metal, electrical tape also works really well. Uh, any sort of HDPE bumpers, wood bumpers, anything like that, give a little bit of protection to these wheels and the outside of your robot so when it collides with other things, you are less likely to affect an ESD event. Again, this is one of those things that is not going to be a problem until it is a problem. And trying to suss out electrical issues is such a nightmare that if you can, try to create some sort of sheathing around your robot so you're less likely to make these contacts for those direct ESD events. Another thing you should use is a grounding strap. So what the grounding strap does in FTCV specifically is it makes your control system the same potential as your robot chassis. So for example, if you don't have a grounding strap, your electronics are going to have a different potential charge than the rest of your robot in the chassis. But if you can ground your control system to your robot, it gives everything the same charge. So that means you're not going to have a large difference like that self-electrocuting robot did with those separate pins. So you should always be using a grounding strap so that you don't have your robot shock itself from the inside. Again, it's not going to be able to something you're going to be able to notice or tell, but it is going to make your robot a lot more reliable over the season. So 100%, you should always be using a grounding strap. And using grounding straps is really easy. You just literally take the XT connector, plug it into the empty XT port, and then strap that down to anything that's metal on your robot. So what about induction events? I alluded to this earlier, but effectively you can think about a flow of current producing a magnetic field. I like to think like each wire has its own electrical field that it produces. And every single wire is kind of like its own little radio antenna. It actually pushes out a field, a magnetic field around it. And if you were to bring another wire closer, those magnetic fields are going to interact and especially loops of wires and that's where you can have that interaction or it's called induction of electricity uh, this mentor put down a few different videos you can take a look at i'll link in the description down below for more introduction on that but for the most part we need to know that any sort of wire is capable of absorbing 
uh, different ESD events. So we need to find a way of protecting that. So not only can you have ESD events when another robot crashes in, but if something has a large charge differential between the two, you can even have that affected as well. So again, the mentor has taken another one of those stink, stick lighters, <laughs> taken on the butane, uh, and then separated those wires for the igniter uh, so that it can have a repeatable spark against a section of U-channel. And this is the primary test setup. They have taken a section of wire, looped it around, and then they did five shocks, and they captured that data using a USB oscilloscope. And they have uh, mentioned which one they've used specifically here. And then they have measured uh, peak and root sum square. They used ferrites through some of these tests, and uh, it's just random Amazon ferrites. So keep in mind on the potential quality of those. So they ran a whole whack load of tests for us, and they circled the best results as well for what's going to have the lowest coupled energy and what the flat loop is, which is basically their control, and then everything else that goes on from there. So what kind of data was able to be pulled out from there? So one of the big takeaways is from this primary test to adding ferrites across these tests and in multiple orientations around it, ferrites on the coils of wires did not have a huge effect. So adding a ferrite across this did not make a huge effect. What did have a huge effect is instead of taking your wires and arranging them in a loop, taking that same wire and folding an accordion. So when I say a loop, it's effective if you were to take this wire and you were to loop it around your hand like so, so that it makes an unbroken loop. This is a terrible idea, and this makes it really easy for induction events to cause uh, havoc with your wiring. Instead, accordion fold is when you take this and you bunch it up underneath, bunch this up underneath, bunch this up underneath, and bunch it up, and then you are folding your piece in like an accordion to reduce having loops. And that was one of the biggest outcomes. Surprisingly, adding a ferrite loop actually ended up making it worse on some of the tests. So it was actually pretty inconsistent. Another big help, as opposed to using an accordion fold, was adding a space in between the wire and that metal channel itself. So there's a six millimeter spacer and a 12 millimeter spacer. Again, adding in a ferrite didn't really seem to change much there. So let's take a look at the full recommendations here. The best way to reduce electrostatic discharge events is just using some really simple wire management points. Instead of using the looped wire, you should use an accordion wire and that accordion fold. As most of these ESD events are through that robot frame, we have to make sure we're keeping track of these. So don't make loops whatever you do. I need to keep saying that a bunch. Uh, another one, do not bundle your signal wires with your power motor wires because your motor wires are going to be pushing a lot more current through compared to your signal wires. And it's more likely that you could have some issues. Keep some space between them. If you can, don't mount your electronics themselves directly to metal. Leave a little bit of space. Add some plastic in them. Uh, from this mentor's test, 6 millimeter to 12 millimeter spacings reduced most of the ESD events. Uh, one thing I'll say about this, I would suggest you don't add power systems right on top of the control hub because this is where the Wi-Fi man module is and you're going to reduce your Wi-Fi uh, range on that. But the rest of these points are sound and that having your hubs mounted is something that's non-conductive. So ferrites can be helpful on wire bundles, but they don't do much on a single straight run. And the mentor went through and they did a few more tests for us and they did a, a single straight wire setup. So again, they ran the same tests Rather than using loops of wires, they've used a bundle of wires across a signal wire. Uh, and this was the rev color uh, sensor, which is running over an I2C uh, band. Uh, and then if we look at through their tests, they found that the more space they added on a single wire between a conductive surface, be that the robot's chassis, and the main point was that you would reduce a lot of those peaks. So for instance, we can see those peaks reduce as we increase our spacing over time. Twisting the wires didn't seem to do anything. So twisting wires is not really important. And ferrite maybe helps on a single section. So adding a ferrite in the middle of our system here maybe helps, but maybe it doesn't. It seems to be one of those cat's paws things in that it's, you got a luck of the draw on the ferrite. So it seems poor to recommend adding ferrite. 
Another point on those ferrite chokes. This is going to be a controversial opinion, but it's backed up by this mentor's data. The best place to put ferrites will be on motor wires, not on signal wires. And this has to do with how ferrites themselves work. So a fundamental understanding about ferrite chokes is that ferrite chokes are really good at reducing signal on differential signal lines. And what that means is where your signal wires are paired in a positive and negative signal. The only wires that FTC uses for these are your USB cables and your RS-485 cables. Those are the cables that connect the expansion hub to the control hub and, of course, any USB devices you have. So if you have a USB and that RS-485, adding a ferrite choke to those will be positive. Adding a ferrite choke to a signal wire, be that a digital signal, be that an I2C port, be that an analog port, is not going to help at all. In fact, it might actually harm your signal data because ferrite chokes do not affect that magnetic current on differential signals, the things where you have that positive coming up one wire and negative coming down. The thing about I2C digital and analog ports is they're all single wire methods of transportation, which means that they're only sending voltage one way. So you're actually going to be reducing the quality of your signal by adding a ferrite choke onto an I2C, onto a digital or onto an analog port. So for that differential signal, like your USB and your RS-485, to the point of a ferrite, those positive and negative uh, signals cancel each other out. But for all other cables, it's actually reducing some of those high peak uh, switches, which is what you actually want from those signals. So things like your servo wires, where you have your signal going over PWM signals, the things that ferrite actually cancels out, those high peak and low values of a PWM signal, it's very similar to what a ferrite choke actually reduces out. So do not use those ferrite chokes for anything but a USB and an RS-485. One exception, though. You may find it beneficial to add a ferry choke near your DC motor. So a DC motor, despite it being a differential signal, is likely not going to produce an issue unless you are making rapid shifts in acceleration and stop. So either back braking from hitting something or trying to turn around the other direction. For a brief period of time, that will create a voltage spike. So adding in a ferrite choke near the end of your DC motor, not near the control hub, may actually help reduce some of those ESD effects. I know that's pretty controversial there on ferrites, but it's backed up by data. And the reality about ferrites is if you start getting into ferrite chokes for signal or for single line data connections, especially in the industrial world, they have technicians who spend their entire job is figuring out what sort of signal noise they want to take out. And just slapping a ferrite on and hoping that it works is a terrible idea. So to recap, if we were to go over those quickly, those electrostatic discharge events, it's not a huge deal if you have charge on your robot. What is a problem is when your robot comes in contact with another robot or another object that has a differential charge from you. Most of those, most of these insulating plastic or non-wood or sorry, non-metal will insulate and creating a shell around your robot for when you connect with these things is a great way of stopping that. When it comes to running your wires and protecting against the induction, Mount those PLCs and those control hubs, those expansion hubs, on top of some sort of non-conductive material. It doesn't have to be very thick, but mount it up on there. Don't block your Wi-Fi chip. Uh, do not make loops for your wires. Instead, use that accordion fold. And for ferrites, only add ferrites on your USB and your RS-485. Do not add them to any other wires unless you're adding them to your DC motors near the motors themselves. Do not add them to servo motors. It's going to seems to do more harm than help. So thanks again to that mentor for sharing all this knowledge and <laughs> some pretty controversial opinions when it comes to ferrite, but I hope it actually gives you some more real world data to go off of with that ferrite data. Did anything surprise you? Let me know in the comments down below. Otherwise, best of luck out there this season and good luck on your next Relax project.